Welcome to the Swag Girls podcast, the self-publishing podcast for authors. You're in the right place for the best writing, marketing and publishing advice, plus interviews with industry experts and best-selling authors. I'm Cheryl Phipps. I'm Wendy Vella. And I'm Trudy J. Hello, everyone. <laughs> and Hello. this week, <laughs> this week, we have another New Zealand author with us, which is always really, really exciting. We've yep. got Soraya Lane, who uh, writes historical and contemporary. Is that right? Have I got that? Yes, it is. Yeah. They're all sort of love stories in some way, but there's sort of historical books and contemporary as well. Yeah, awesome, great. awesome. So we're going to have an awesome chat to you today. I'm really excited about it. Um, but first, Wendy is going to read your bio before we get into everything. Soraya M. Lane graduated with a law degree before realizing that law wasn't the career for her and that her future was in writing. And aren't we pleased about that? She is the author of historical and contemporary women's fiction and her novel Wives of War was an Amazon charts bestseller. Soraya lives on a small farm in her native New Zealand with her husband, two young sons, and a collection of four-legged friends. When she's not writing, she loves to be outside playing make-believe with her children or snuggled up inside read reading. Soraya is the Amazon charts and number one Kindle best-selling author of The Secret Midwife and The Lost Daughters series with over a million copies of her historical woman's fiction novels sold. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> aren't you great yeah <laughs> so i sound good I wrote yeah. Bio. <laughs> yeah over a that's what everyone copies. says it's so really cool. funny yeah. yeah we're always shocked when so, we read our hear our own bios and go what yes. is <laughs> <laughs> well aren't i awesome yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so soraya let's just talk about how you so that awesome transition from being from being a lawyer into um becoming a writer and, and your writing journey so could you just sort of um Give, give us your backstory. Yeah, yeah, give sure. us your origin story. And I do apologize for my voice. It's um, it's just holding up very croaky today. Um, so I went to I, I went to law school and graduated with a law degree. And I I feel that, you know, neither of my parents went to university. I was an only child. There was a lot of expectation that they were very proud that I was going to be able to go to university. So I feel that perhaps if I hadn't had that. I wouldn't say pressure, so well maybe pressure. Um, but they sort of um, they really wanted to me to have the opportunities they didn't have, and so I went to university. It sort of seemed like you know the only path at the time, and I sort of looked through everything. It's like well I'm not good at science, I'm not good at maths, but I'm great at English, and um, and it was sort of like you know the little boxes you went through. It was like arts degree or law, so I enrolled in both of them. Um, I eventually dropped the arts part because I was just wanted to get out of university faster and didn't want to stay for that extra year. Um, and then I graduated and I just, I think I still, I'd always wanted to write. I had still been writing um, during that period. I was writing a lot of poetry and just sort of little short stories. And I just feel that that, that love of writing had been there from such a young age and was still there. And suddenly the thought of being in a law office and, and having that job, and I could just see that I was never going to, at the time as a 21 year old, felt like I was never going to get back to writing. And I sort of decided to take a year and I thought, well, look, I'll just start writing. And I so I wrote my first novel sort of during that period. I think I was sort of perhaps in my last year of uni and I was writing a lot. Um, I wrote a very sweeping big pirate story that took me two years to write. It was like 120,000. <laughs> and I was reading at the time, I was always reading those books, um, those historical romances with the, you know, the white shirt ripped off the man and all the, they were pirates or they were, I don't know, <sighs> they were swords, they were brilliant. And so I thought, well, that's what I'll write because that's what I love um, reading. And it didn't quite go to plan. I got a lot of rejections. Um, and back then we had to, if you were trying to get, well, the, the only way to get published was traditional publishing back then. Um, this was sort of 20 years ago. And so you had to mail off your partial manuscript off to New York or to London or somewhere. It cost an absolute fortune to send from New Zealand. Um, and so I sort of went through that process for a number of years. I never, I applied for a couple of jobs in, in law and I received an offer and then I would make an excuse as to why it wasn't the right job for me. And so I ended up being a freelance writer for some years, um, right up until my, oh, until my second son was born and he's 10 now. Um, and before I went full-time writing, but I ended up writing for Harlequin Mills and Boone to start with. Um, I wrote, I think 14 books for them, um, writing for their sweet romance line, which was quite a departure from my very <laughs> sexy parents that I started in <laughs> And then, um, and then I started writing for St. Martin's Press. That was sort of my pivot into single title. And that was about the time, I can't even think what year it was. It was probably like 2013, maybe. I'm trying to think when self-publishing sort of started being a thing. 
And suddenly it was like, oh, so that thing people talked about at conferences, um, you know, this, this self-publishing, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's worth having a look into. And I actually went back to uni and did a master's degree in a master of fine arts and creative writing. Um, one of those things I thought, okay, I'm seeing all these agents signing authors with these MFA degrees. I'm going to get one of those. And so I went and did that and wrote my first historical novel, which was um, ended up being Wives of War. I originally published that as, um, gosh, I've just forgotten the title. Um, anyway, we, I self-published that. I had an agent at the time and she said to me, look, I can't sell this. No one's going to buy it. There's no appetite for this kind of book. Like it's, um, you know, you've got four main characters, your alternating points of view. Like this is just not something I can sell. And I said to her, well, are you okay if I try this self-publishing thing? And she was like, oh, go for it. You know, like I, I couldn't care less sort of thing. She was not Basically, interested. you're going to fail. So yes, exactly. it yourself. <laughs> I was like, so you're not going to take your 15% if it, you know, if it sells. Yeah. And she was like, yeah. oh, no, that's just way too much administration work. Like, just, <laughs> just go for it. And so I actually published it. And it was just before I came up for one of the Romance Writers Conferences. Um, they were always held in Auckland at the time. And I remember I've got my writing friend, um, Natalie Anderson, and she she actually texted me and said, have you seen how well that book of yours is doing on Amazon? And I said to her, oh, I kind of don't even know how to log in and look at it. Like <laughs> I was, you know, it was just such a new thing. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I can't even, it just seemed, it just was so foreign to me at the time. And um, I said to her, oh, it's like ranked like 400 and something. Like, do you think that's good? And she said, I think so. Like you can log in and look at your, you can log in and look at your sales. And so I went logged in and I was like, oh, that's actually quite a few books. And then I worked out how much I was making off each book. And I thought, this actually isn't too bad. And so anyway, the book just kept going. And I don't know why. I mean, at that time, there wasn't the huge number of books we have now. Um, you know, there weren't the the huge number of authors self-publishing. And also then you could do a free promotion. And at the time, the way the algorithms were working, if you were number five in the free store, you would then, that would translate over and you would hit the top 100 in the paid store. It was just so different then. And so the book took off. And then I actually received a phone call. I've received an email from Amazon Publishing, um, from their London publishing house, asking me what plans I had next for my next book. Um, and so uh, I thought, well, this is interesting. So I sent it to my agent and who was suddenly very interested in my <laughs> point of view, historical fiction. Um, and they, and they, they kept asking questions about what was next and what were my thoughts. And, and I sort of, and she said to me, oh, it's fine. Like you can engage with them, like, you know, talk with them. It's real. It's not, you know, it's not a scam email. And, uh, and then they sent through an offer and said, we would like to republish that the self-published book that became Wives of War. So in a very um, fast nutshell, that was, um, that was my journey, like self-publishing, even though I'm a mainly traditional published author now, without self-publishing, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have launched this whole new part of my career that just yeah. really did change my life and allowed me to become a full-time writer. Um, without that, without that sale, it just would never have happened. So wow, that's just a totally yeah. different take on things, isn't it? It's, we've never yeah. had that story before. So that's sure. that's very cool. Yeah. Thank you. And what year yeah. was that? What, what sort of year? What, um, what, I'm trying to think. I've actually got something on the wall here. So it must have been two. I think I must have self-published in 2012, and right. then. I think they bought the rights in 2013 and then we must have, um, then they republished it. So what was interesting at the time is they said to me, look, you can keep your self-published version um, on Amazon and keep selling wow. yourself exclusive with Amazon. I don't even know whether you could publish elsewhere that easily back then. It was, you know, Amazon seemed to be the only thing. Um, and so they said, just keep it up there. It's fine. So I, they offered me an advance, which I obviously accepted and a, um, a contract for the second book. Uh, and then they said to me, oh, just keep selling it. So I was still earning money off it. That was crazy. So it was on there. And I think we had maybe six months of editorial, like they wanted to make some changes. Mm -hmm. I had always wanted to change the ending slightly because some of my readers didn't like the something that was resolved at the end. And so they said, no, that's fine. We worked on, on some edits. And then they, then one day they said, okay, we're going to do the changeover. And so over a 24 hour period, it changed from, um, whatever I had it self published as to, um, Voyage of the Heart with the new cover and all these things and they said that they didn't want to lose the reviews or anything so they wanted to keep that original one up there because I think I had quite a few hundred reviews at the time and so and then suddenly it changed over and it was published by Amazon so it was a really interesting process to see how they yeah how they viewed it and, and how the whole thing mm -hmm. worked yeah. um and at the time my editor 
uh, who was the editorial director from the London office with Amazon. And I think a lot of people don't realize that Amazon do have their own publishing house. So yeah. um, they are mm. publishing their own titles. They've got a number of imprints. Um, they've got two offices, one in America and, and one in London. And she said to me, my part of my job is to look through the top at the time to look through at the top indie titles, um, you know, say the top five women's fiction, the top five historical fiction or, or whatever it was at the time that they were looking for and to keep an eye on those things. And if they're self-published, then, you know, we often will reach out. And, and if the author has, if we feel that we can help them build a career and that they have more ideas for the next books, then that's what we're exploring. So I don't know whether that happens now, but there were a number of other uh, Amazon authors who were picked up in the same way that I was. Mm -hmm. I think it, I think yeah. it was a ripple in time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, and I, congratulations yeah. that you were yeah, there to, to jump and on. It so have... it, sorry, it was just you know it was that opportunity at the time, and I think new things are scary. And and for me, it was sort of like, is it worth you know paying the money to have the book, um, you know, formatted? And and I had to obviously do a cover, and it was also new to me. Um, but I do think that sometimes it is just worth taking the opportunity and just seeing what happens. Um, obviously, this was there was a lot of luck involved in terms of, you know, there were obviously other books in that genre that were doing well. And I somehow piggybacked off that. Yeah. I think now, you know, you have to put so much thought into your keywords and trying to do these things. But at the time, it was um, there was a lot of luck just involved at that period of time when self-publishing was quite new. Uh, yeah. So I do think that I definitely benefited from that, you know, that little little moment in time. Mm. Yeah, well, I think there's done. always been That's voracious awesome. readers, but there's just yeah. so many more books out there now. <clears throat> of so course, there's yeah, so much more choice. Yeah, yeah I think. So how many books have you got now with um, Amazon, and and are you still publishing with them? Is yes, I am actually. Um, so I think I'm at. Four, uh, I think I've just. Hmm. I think I've had my twelfth or thirteenth published uh, just this year. I'm pretty sure I just turned in number fourteen. I need to have a tally up. Um, so I have written for them for some time. I also actually at the time pitched them uh, when I first sold my historical novel because um, I was romance is my first love. You know, I've always written romance. I've loved reading romance. I still love it. Um, and my historical books were there's, there's romantic elements in every single one of them, but they're much more historical women's fiction or book club fiction as Amazon call them. Um, and yeah, it's, I, I pitched them a rom romance at the time and I sold two contemporary single title romances to them and I just adored those books. I loved writing them. Historical fiction is, for me, is so hard. Every time I start a new book, I'm like, why, why am I doing this? Like, it's just, yeah. I yeah. find it so hard. Whereas I sit down to write romance and it's like, the words oh, just la, la, la. easier mm. and I love it and I fall in love with these characters and it's just, um, I just, for me, it's, it's easier. I think it's probably a natural fit for me. Um, and those books didn't do as well and I you know off the back of my historical fiction I thought these books are going to fly they're going to sell so many mm. copies and they probably sold maybe 20 percent of what the historical fiction had sold and oh, so wow. I had that, and I thought I was going to have this sort of dual career mm. with them writing mm. romance for Montlake <laughs> romance and writing historical fiction for Lake Union and my editor came back and said we've got good news and bad news we've got you know we'd love to build you in historical fiction but we're going to pass on your next romances. And I was just crushed. I was just so devastated. Mm -hmm. And um, and I thought, okay, well, look, I can still write romance. I can still, I can self-publish. I can do these things, which yeah. I did continue doing for a while. Um, but she, at the time she said to me, you know, if you look at it, romance, the romance genre as a pond, you're going to be this little fish trying to compete with all these huge authors mm -hmm. and so many authors coming in. Whereas at the time in the, the World War II historical fiction I was writing, she said there's just not as many authors in that pond. So we feel we can really build you and, and create a readership for you. And when I look back on it, they were right. Like they were able to create that, um, mm -hmm. you know, with me and, and build on that readership. And it has changed over the, over the last five years because there is so much World War II fiction now. Um, at the time, there wasn't a huge amount of female-led, you know, um, just that real exploring um, history from the female lens. And I feel this, that was a huge shift at the time towards that. Um, so it's definitely a, a much bigger pond now. Yeah. But I, I do appreciate that now, that it was much harder to try and build that brand within romance when there was so much competition at the time and, and still is. I mean, and so contemporary, anymore. especially, you know, like exactly. contemporary romance, even now, it's the biggest yes. fish out there and the biggest pond out there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, mm, yeah. absolutely. You know, I mean, there's a lot of subgenres so, and stuff, but yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really curious then. So you said that you find it quite hard to write the historical romance yes. can you, or historical fiction. So can you tell us a little bit about it? Like what, what kind of things do you need to make sure that are in there and why do you find it more difficult? 
difficult. Look, when I, when I wrote that first it. historical fiction novel, it took me a long time and it took me, I think, two years. I was working full time as well, but it, it took me two years to write the 100,000 word historical fiction novel. And the research just about killed me. I think the hardest thing to start with was when do I stop researching and when do I start writing? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. even now, sometimes I find that hard because I feel like you could just keep on going. And at some point you have to go, okay, I've got the overview of, of my, you know, my, whatever time, period of time I'm, I'm researching, I know what's happening. I, you know, I'm familiar enough with it to start writing. And then I, I tend to sort of just research, do mini research sort of, um, you know, a, hours sort of across the day I'll think okay I'm going to stop now and, and find out a bit more about this um, but I'm much better at just continuing on with the story but I just think um, I feel like it's balancing that it's balancing history it's almost like having history having that sort of historical component I feel like is like having another big character you know mm -hmm. trying to yeah. trying to make sure that you're building it correctly in the story and that you're including enough but not too much to make it boring um, mm -hmm. and just layering in those that, mm -hmm. those historical moments. And I feel like when I'm writing romance, um, I mean, I'm 41 now, but I still feel like I'm, you know, 30. I, I think you sort, of, <laughs> you sort of have that age. So when I write yeah. contemporary romance or, you know, my my contemporary stories, I feel like it's my voice. You know, it's um, I feel like I'm that character and it's easy to sort of think of what they're going to say and all these things. Whereas writing someone is set in the 30s or 40s, it's sort of um, it just doesn't feel so natural. You have to I have to think more about, you know, how they're speaking or um, you know, what they're doing or the their thought process at the time. And I just how they feel about something. Yeah, it's going to be and so I different. Because you haven't experienced that yeah. exactly so that time period yeah. yourself. Yeah, exactly. And so I just, I just always find it harder and I feel it's just always harder to sort of, I feel like with a romance, I can sit down and I, I mean, I'm a real pantser, like at heart, I just like sitting down and writing mm -hmm. and having some notes and, and just going for it. Um, whereas with my historical fiction, I plot it out chapter by chapter. And so if I'm honest, that is the, that is the part that's torture. Yes, so, yes. <laughs> It's, it's not, not natural to you. It's so not it's, natural. Yeah. And yeah. when I start writing, it's a brilliant tool and it's so much easier to write with oh, this brilliant outline. We all wish we um, could do but, that. Well, but I, I just, um, and my editor at Amazon actually made me do it. She said, you know, because I was having quite big edits, um, at, you know, she was, we were having to do quite big rewrites and things. And she said, if you have it plotted out so carefully and go chapter by chapter, you know, it's much easier to then go through and make changes to that, say, five page you know, outline or 10 page outline than it is to have to rip the story apart. So I do appreciate that. And I try very hard to be a plotter, but when How I do write, you plot? How do you oh, plot? I don't even, I just start with a pencil and paper and I start by making little flow charts and then somehow it turns into this master document that's a lot bigger. Um, but no, I tend to, I mean, I'm quite good now. I feel like because I've been doing this a while and writing this genre for some time, I sort of get a feel for how long each chapter is going to be and, you know, whether I need like a 4,000 word chapter for the, say the first few chapters and then a, a shorter one. And then, a, you know, I sort of feel like I have that. I can sort of see the ebbs and flows of the story and, and mm. how it works now, but I actually don't even know how I plot. I just sit down and somehow mm. I start watching and it just works. Um, and it does take me quite some time, but um, it's hard. Like plotting is so, so hard. hard. I'd love. I like the idea of a flow chart. To be yeah. honest, I yeah. like the plotting genie to working. come to me Lots at night. Arrows and, just and yeah, 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 yeah. Plotting. I think as I, as you get older, it's harder too. Definitely. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious about the idea of um, history. Sorry, I'm going to go back to history. Moving on from plotting, and um, <laughs> the idea of history is another character. And so, how much of how much of the story is there was this historical event here and this historical event here and how do you sort of weave in the fiction elements of your characters and you know how how do you work all that together into one I don't know I, don't, I just I feel like I don't know um when I am working on it it just seems to come together but I feel like so I mean for instance sorry um I feel like so the book that I've just finished um, is called The Pianist's Wife, and we've just finished structural edits on that. So that's um, all, all finished finally. Um, and that book there, I knew I had to have part of it, <clears throat> excuse me, set in a concentration camp. And that is something I've found really hard. The last couple of books mm. I have had concentration camps, and that has been a whole nother, a whole yeah. nother thing. It's been yeah. quite true. Um, but it was more sort of plotting backwards. Like I needed to have them escape. I needed to find a concentration camp where 
where someone had escaped from, you know, authentically, so no one could say to me, there is no possible way. Oh, and don't they though, eh? Aren't they (laughs) supposed to email you, right? (laughs) Because I get those emails and you go, actually, I have to be able to say, actually, and, you know, 1945 and whatever, something happened. (laughs) I've so, had a few of those. I, I've had to send links in the end and say, this is why yeah. I've done that. And I'm right, not you. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like, so for that one, I knew that I had to have this um, escape work. And I knew that I had to have, there was a certain um, moment in time where they ran out of um, they ran out of gas, which was horrific. And so they couldn't, um, and they also ran out of the, a lot of fuel. And so they couldn't burn the bodies at the concentration camp. And there was, a, and there were two people who managed to hide amongst these bodies and then escape. Um, and it was just sort of like a one day window where there was actually an opportunity to hide and then and then escape from the camp. Um, and so I sort of then had to work backwards from there and go, OK, I want this to be authentic. I can fudge it by a couple of months, but it has to happen in the, say, the last half or the first half of 1945. Um, and so I just feel like things like that can sort of um, can make me stop for a bit because then I think, well, then I can't make other parts of the story work. And right. You know, start because I want these people to experience something else that happened in 1939 so I feel like it's sometimes you know mapping out that timeline to start with and then trying to figure out okay this is these are the bits of history I need to include um, and that are important to my story and that I don't want to Mm. get wrong Uh, and then yeah so I feel like that's probably my starting point is is figuring Mm. out that that key timeline Um, and that would be huge because you don't want to have to fix that like they no, say at yeah. the end of the story. And that's the exactly, thing. If you yeah. realize that you have so one hard. of the things wrong, it changes everything. Because, everything, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's um so in that, and I think because I've been writing World War II for some time, you know, I've sort of got that main gap between sort of between 1939 and the story finishing, sometimes going through to 1946. And so I feel now that that part of history is easier for me because I I do mm-hmm. have that broad base now. Like, you know, I know what happened during the war. All these things that I didn't know when I first started out that were, you know, I had to find out every little detail. So I do know what they were wearing now. I know what they were eating. I know what, you know, it was like for them. Obviously, if I move to a different part of Europe, there will be new things to research. But I feel like I'm quite fortunate now that I have that base knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, but still, they'll be, okay, well, I'm going to focus on this part. Um, you know, one of my books was about female journalists at the time, and that was fascinating. But it was, mm-hmm. you know, finding out I didn't want to get caught up on anything. Thing. And that's my biggest fear. So it's just finding out those key points and going, okay, well, I can sort of, there are little things I can fudge and that I can get away with because you've just got to keep the story going, obviously. Um, and I can put a note at the end saying, look, you know, um, I'm aware that this happened whenever, but, you know, f- for the sake of the story, mm. I, I did bring that forward a little. Um, and then also, if you're going to have real characters, you know, real people from history, um, it's making sure that you get all that information correct. Um, so I do feel it's sort of that yeah, creating history like as a character, um, going back to the question, sort of figuring out my timeline, what needs to happen and what key information I want to put in there. And my readers love, his, they love the book being set in a period in history, but they don't want to be overloaded with historical information. Yeah. No, they're, no. They're there for the characters. Yeah. Um, mm. So it's just sort of, it's just layering those things in. And, and sometimes I might put too much in. I think you're better off to put too much in in your first draft and then be able to pull it back. Yeah. Um, but, be thinking oh I actually haven't got enough history in there so it's mm. just always a balancing act but I feel like um if you'd asked me this question sort of eight years ago I probably would have had a better answer but now I've been doing <laughs> it for a while, it becomes instinctual and I feel like yeah. I just mm. somehow it comes together and I you know it just um it just all works in the end so how long did no, this take you to write well, they take me a wee while, but I seem to be very crunched with deadlines, so I'm having to write them faster than normal. But usually, I mean, if I was to be given my ideal schedule, I would have four months of writing, and the books are normally, I normally turn them in around 85,000 words, and they normally end up being about 90,000 after edits, mm-hmm. um, after my edits with my editor. Um, so we normally always add in sort of 5,000 words. Um, but at the moment, I'm having to write them more like in a, three month window which is is pretty tight yeah um, yeah which has been hard For that um, length, yeah it is yeah and even like so I have another set of my lost daughter series I write they're around 80,000 words as well so I'm sort of um sometimes 85,000 so they're all quite big books um mm. but I feel like I can normally write them faster than my than my sort of bigger World War II stories mm. Um, but no, four months is a is a comfortable time for me. I feel like if I had six months, it was perfect. You know, um, a month of extra of sort of deep research, four months writing, and then a month editing would be my ideal. Mm. Uh, but I'm yeah, I'm, I'm unfortunately having to do it a little bit faster than that at the moment. And these ones are all standalones, aren't they? They are yes. Yeah, all the yeah. all the historical ones are standalone. Mm. 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's how many books? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, so for that four months, are you writing two, three books a year, or is it there a gap between writing? Or there is no gap. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> She'd like a gap. <laughs> I would love a gap. Wouldn't we all? Um, yep. <laughs> every time I think I'm going to have a gap, you know, this Christmas I'm going to have four weeks off that I'm not going to write, and then it just never happens. Yeah. Um, but and look, you know, I feel like I also feel like I have this fear that if I have a break, I might not, I might forget how to write. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> So is it we all of- have that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I'm writing. So I'm having to deliver three books a year at the moment. Um, I've got two publishers. So Amazon Publishing with my historicals and then Bookature who are publishing my Lost Daughter series. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm writing two two books for Bookature a year and one for Amazon. But I mean, I'm sort of delivering one for Amazon every nine months. So it's sort of, it all just, it, it does get mm. quite tight. Um, and I don't know how... Mm. I'm going to have to have more of a gap uh, going forward, but this is me for the next and sort of until um, probably this time next year. Yeah. The end of next year. Do you write well under pressure? Because of some authors. Yeah, I I do. I think um, because when I was working full time and writing books, uh, when I first sold to Harlequin Romance, I, I think I was writing four books a year for them then. And I had a newborn baby and I had a full-time job. So that was great fun. Um, but um, I feel like I've always had to write under pressure. You know, when I yeah. was when I was freelance writing, you know, you had, I was turning in say two, you know, 1,000 word articles a day or something like that. Um, and I was doing some advertising copy and I was writing, you know, trying to get my thousand words done a day um, for my fiction writing. So I just sort of feel like it's the way it's always been. I'm, I'm sort of used to it. So I guess I do, I, I guess I do work well under pressure. Um, I don't really know any different, I suppose, is the answer. So, so thousand, right. your, your sort of key is a thousand words a day. Is that what you're um, trying no, to write to? No, I was, it's when the book was shorter, it was a thousand yeah. words a day. Yeah. Um, and when I transitioned to writing fiction full time, I was more like 2000 words a day was my aim. Um, at the moment I'm trying to increase that I feel like I can like for me I feel like 2,000 words is very achievable and I think when we have a goal each day we don't want to have a goal that's you know you don't want to feel like you're failing every day you Mm. want to feel like you can actually Mm. hit that target and so for me 2,000 words is 100% achievable if I've written 1,500 I can sit down and write 500 more words before bed if I haven't met my goal Um, whereas I feel like when I tried to put that pressure on of I have to write 3,000 a day some days were really hard and I started feeling like I was letting myself down, but when yeah. actually 2000 words a day is, is fantastic. Like, you know, you should be proud of that kind of um, output. So I am having to catch up a little bit at the moment, but I feel like, yeah, for me, normally 2000 words is my, my aim. And if you go over it, it's such a win, isn't it? It's such yeah. a win. I suddenly know. realize you've written three like, or 4,000 yeah. words. You're like, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And what time of day are you writing? Do you get up early? Because I know you've got a family and, and yes. other commitments in your day. I definitely don't get up early. I'm not a morning person. <laughs> um, I would rather w- write till midnight and sleep until, you know, 7.30 or 8 o'clock than get up at, um, not that I get to sleep until that time. Um, but in my ideal world, if I was just on my own, I would work till midnight and sleep until 8. Um, mm. But no, so the kids, my kids are off to school um, sort of about 8 o'clock. Um, in the morning, my husband takes them to school. And so I tr- I'm trying to get to my desk at 8.30. I find that quite hard because mm. I sort of, I'm, I am I naturally want to just sort of do nothing, like, you know, just sort of go on social media and read <laughs> the news, do things for, you know, a couple of hours. But I'm trying very hard now to actually start writing at 8.30. Um, and I feel like I'm doing better at working in the morning and then not, because I think the older you get, the harder it is to work at night, <laughs> like to get back to the computer yeah. after dinner. Or um, And so I I am trying to do the sort of the bulk of my writing earlier in the day, but I am lucky that, you know, the kids are at school and I do have, I do have the whole day, like the whole school day to write. So, mm-hmm. um, and it depends, like if I'm editing, I will work pretty much nonstop. Like I feel like I will do, you know, I'll stop for lunch, but I will, I can easily work for sort of a five hour blog. Whereas when I'm writing fresh, I feel like it's a lot harder. Like, you know, you sort of do, mm. I'll often do a timer for 20 minutes and then have a break and then go back again. So I do feel like that I can have that intense concentration when I'm editing. Um, but it is definitely harder to keep that concentration when, mm. um, you know, for longer blocks of time when I'm yeah. writing. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. That the, so you just do it in little blocks and you'll take a break and then come back yeah. to it just throughout the day? Like if, um, if I have the timer set, 
I feel like I'll be like, oh, you know, 15 minutes is up or 20 minutes is up and I'll stop it. And then I'll go, oh, I'll start again and I'll, I'll hit the timer again. Whereas I feel like if I just sat down, I'd be like, oh, it's been 20 minutes already. You know, yeah. so I do think it's, um, the timer can really help. I think if, if you're struggling, you know, even, even 10 minutes, you know, it's like, okay, I can do 10 minutes. Don't go on social media. Don't, you know, don't do anything else. Don't get up and make another cup of coffee. Just sit for 10 minutes and write. And it is amazing when mm. you force yourself to do that how many words you can get done. And then you go, oh, wow, I managed to get, you know, 250 words done in those 10 minutes. Um, oh, I'll do it again. And suddenly you do that four times and you're at a thousand words. So I do mm. think tools like that, um, you know, tricking ourselves that mm. <laughs> that we're just sort of breaking it up into little and periods. You do have to work to get into the flow sometimes too, don't you? Absolutely. You know, like sometimes yes. it's like wading through mud up, Absolutely. To your, up to your chin. But then a, a, a sort of 10 minutes later, yes. you're actually in the flow. Sometimes you just got to push through it. Yes. And I, I feel think, that, sorry for me, no. you know, one of the things I've learned when I first was probably earlier on in my career, I was very much like, I have to start at chapter one and I have to write, you know, like to write exactly as the book's coming. And I feel like perhaps now that I'm trying to plot more, um, I know more what's happening. And so if I'm stuck, I'll just go and write the beautiful end, you know, the beautiful scene at the end, you mm -hmm. know, I'll write the epilogue or I'll think, oh, I've got this lovely scene in my head that I want to write about you know my two characters and so I'll just write that and put that later in the document and I feel like that gave me a lot more freedom to just keep writing mm -hmm. um and so it does definitely help me get through those those parts where you feel like you're wading through mud um it's just to actually write just to keep writing it doesn't matter if it's the current chapter you're working on just you know write something um that's going mm -hmm. to be used in the story are you a word or yeah, a scrivener or what are you writing I'm just word. I'm very basic, mm. um, just word. And I don't do anything. And I know that there's so many um, other mm. things I could be doing or, but yeah, I'm just, I just open my word document and I just write. Yeah. Do you keep the genres <laughs> separate? Like, do you, you know, say if you're working on one and it's a bit hard, do you ever go switch to the other genre or another book or do you no. just have to stay till it's done? Yeah, I stay with it. I feel like I get very, um, my head gets too busy full of characters. Um, mm. However, I will, if I have it, you know, like say, for instance, if I have some, you know, some edits come back or, you know, proofs on a different book, I can, I feel like I can, I can dip back into editing another book, but I feel like I can't write to it at the same time. Right. You know, yeah. at one point in time, I tried to write, you know, one story in the morning and one in the afternoon, and it just messes with my head. I feel like yeah. I just need to be completely absorbed with that one story and those characters and then, mm. you know, move on to the next one. Mm. Yeah. Especially as yeah. you're writing such intense, you know, with yeah. the research yeah. and all yeah, the stuff yeah. that goes with it. I mean, yeah. that takes time itself. Do you, do you research just off the internet or their books? Yeah, I read? do. I mean, look, um, I, Book Depository has been a huge loss to me mm. because I ordered yeah, so yeah. many research <laughs> books on there. We're all, mm. yeah, everyone's mourning <laughs> that. It's just devastating. And, you know, I went on recently, there was another website someone said was good and I found all the books I needed, but, you know, the shipping was $500 or something. Yeah, right? yeah. So, I did yeah. not order any of those books. Um, I I do love like looking at actual like I like um, highlighting and, and you know putting um, tabs on actual physical research books. So I will often buy them if I if I want to um, use them for a specific you know part of research. Um, I download some books onto my Kindle. Otherwise, yeah. I'm on Google just finding articles. You know, um, it's all there, isn't it? Looking everywhere, yeah. and I feel yeah. like you know you research one thing you know you google one thing and then it leads you down a rabbit hole of finding out so many other things and yeah. so i feel like everything's just there for us it's mm. we're very lucky mm. yeah so we with are. your because you are traditionally published as well yeah. as you got, um so do you do your own email newsletter do you what do you do with socials and stuff like that how, do, how does that work for you yeah look I do my own so I do my own email newsletters um I'm actually just having my website redesigned because it's terrible um and I realized as I looked on my phone recently to look something up and I was like my website doesn't work on phones like how has no one told me that <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah just was shocking and so I'm actually having my newsletter um the person who's designing my website um is doing a new like changing me over to a new platform for newsletter I mean look this I'm just not good at this sort of stuff um it's just uh, she asked me all these technical questions yesterday and I had no idea what she was talking about um but so at the moment I'm just with MailChimp and I send out my my monthly newsletter and my new release newsletter um Amazon are quite the marketing machine they have so everyone who's ever bought one of my books before they sort of get you know targeted um with an email mm. or, um you know as they would do for anyone who's yeah. I, I imagine just with the way all the algorithms work but they're very much like we don't need to worry about anything else we'll just target you know target 
market the people who've read your books before I feel like that doesn't work the way it used to work I mean Mm -hmm. um I certainly my sales are are hugely down compared to what they were sort of pre-COVID or you know five years ago um even with Amazon being the marketing machine they are so um but they tend to do most of the things um you know in terms of targeting my new readers uh, my existing readers um but I do think even with that I feel like my my newsletter is really important um my reader group on Facebook has become probably my most important tool um I started that when I started seeing my my Facebook um you know I just wasn't seeing the interaction I had been seeing with my readers on there so I started my reader group and I feel like it was hard to get the first hundred members and then it just started snowballing and it's just kept on growing and growing um so I do feel for me that um that my reader group on Facebook is my most important tool um I am I'm pretty good at Facebook and and posting on there I have um an amazing friend who's doing about 10 hours a work week as an assistant for me who is sort of helping run the reader group because it did snowball into something a lot bigger than than what I started mm. with and there's so many comments and there's so many posts on there um and and posting on my Facebook page I found that with my foreign translations that I've had particularly the Dutch um the Dutch market that has changed Facebook marketing or well, Facebook for me because my reach just like I'll have a new book come out in the Netherlands and my my page reach and my interactions just, you know, goes up by thousands of times. Like it's, it's just crazy. Oh, wow. um, so I feel that has changed. Mm-hmm. My Facebook page is suddenly becoming, I'm seeing more interaction there that I hadn't seen for years. Um, and then Instagram, I would love to be all over that, but I'm just not that great at posting on there. Um, yeah. So I just, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not a TikTok girl, so that's not happening. Um, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your translation. So have you got, um, who who do you do your translations through and how when did that happen and um, sure. how did so it all start? I started so I've got um another book series. So I've got the Lost Daughter series, which is um a series that I have published with Bookature. And at the time, um so Bookature are a publisher based in the UK, they're also in London. Um, and they are sort of, I feel like they are I, because they're predominantly a digital publisher um, when I published with them it was sort of like okay well they don't offer advances um, so it was a, a different kind of publishing model than I was used to in traditional publishing um, and I sort of thought you know do I self-publish these titles or do I do I partner with someone like Bookature um, and I knew one of the editors there from you know I'd worked with her previously at Amazon and for me it just felt like the right fit because I feel like I feel like in my opinion, to be successful as an indie pub, indie author now, you know, you have to be, it's such a business, right? Like you have mm-hmm. to be so up with marketing and with all the things. And I just want to write. And I, fe- I feel like it's not my strength. Um, and so I decided to partner with them. And one of the reasons I partnered with them was because of their foreign rights director, um, who I was really impressed with. And I knew that he was doing very well in that sort of selling into that European market. Um, so I, I sold the series to Bookature where we're up to book, um, we've got book five being published in, um, in two months time. So it's an eight book series. Um, it felt like a What's huge the genre for that one. Oh, so Sorry. the genre is, well, it's women's fiction. They, I don't really know how to, I don't really know what they're supplying it in. They will call it historical fiction, but then I'm like 60% of the book is set, it's contemporary. Like I don't, um, so it's sort of like it, it's contemporary, it's it's dual timeline. So we've got in every story we have, um, oh. we have sort of 60% of the stories contemporary. Um, the other part is, in, is set in history and they're all, the stories are all linked, but we go back and forward between the two periods. So I have, you know, I have my, my two lovely ladies, one is in the present day and one is in, um, you know, either 1930s, 1940s, 1920s. Um, and so it's been, it's interesting because obviously I've got the historical component that I love, but it's a much shorter, like little pieces of, his, of history in there. Um, and the story is, um, I'm just, lo- I love writing the contemporary part of the story. Um, but anyway, so the book sold, we, uh, after I sold the, the series to them, um, they did very well pitching it to foreign markets. So it was presented at the London Book Fair and we ended up selling into 21 languages, which was just oh, crazy. Wow. Yeah. So, and each of those languages came with an advance. And so even though I'd sold to Bookature and, and, you know, took a leap of faith really with, you know, signing up, I signed up for the initial four books. Um, what was crazy was that I ended up, 
you know, getting all these advances from foreign publishers, um, which mm. obviously was split with Bookature, but um, it ended up being, you know, just, it was just crazy that I, I thought I was taking a leap of faith and not getting anything up front. And then it turned out all, of those. all these foreign <laughs> deals. And I actually had a lot of money up front before the, the first book published. So it was, wow. um, it's been a really interesting process. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool. And, and, so, yeah. and did your agent negotiate all this for you? Uh, she negotiated the original deal with Bookature, but they have, so they've got their own foreign rights director there, Richard, uh, Richard King, who has been, I mean, he is just, I mean, I have to credit him with all the, all the success for the series because he was, he passionately pitched the series. He was amazing. Um, but so my agent didn't actually have to have anything to do with that. She'd negotiated the original split, um, the foreign translation split. So I think, you know, most publishers, it's sort of standard to be 70-30 or um, with some of the digital publishers, 80-20 in favor of the author. Um, so she'd negotiated that, but that was sort of her her involvement really ended there. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just been, it's been really eye-opening with the foreign markets because, I mean, there are so many self-published authors doing very well having their own books translated. And it's something I had thought a lot about, but once again, I just thought it just seemed like so much admin for me or, you know, that uh, having to do all that, I, I really decided, I really felt like I wanted someone else to take that on. And the reason I partnered with Bookature is because they had that in-house and I could see how well it was working. Whereas a lot of other publishers, you know, they might, it might a huge publisher might have one person handling all the foreign rights for, you know, yeah. so many mm. others, um, all they outsource um, to, you know, to, to someone else or to a, a foreign rights agent. And while that can be, um, that can work really well, I just sort of felt like I had researched those foreign markets Um I sort of felt like I went back to basics with the series and thought if I'm going to write something else and if I'm going to have this whole nother, because I feel like I'm juggling two full-time jobs with these two publishers. Um, if I'm going to do all this, I want it to be worthwhile. Like I want to hit mm. the mark. I want to, I want to appeal to those readers and what is selling well in Europe. And I, I, I didn't realize I'm sort of probably more aware of all the information now, um, which I love to share with other authors because the, all the information is right there. We can just Google it and find out. You can look yeah. at the best seller, Spiegel bestseller list in Germany. You can look at the Dutch bestseller list. You can find out, you know, what books are selling well in places like Norway. Like all these markets, they tend to have a real crossover. If a book is doing well in the Netherlands, it tends yeah. to be doing great in Norway and Finland, mm. you know. Um, mm. And places like Finland are doing really well in audio sales, which is blowing me away. Um, so I sell more audio books in Finland than I sell of, you know, paperbacks. Um, and so I feel like if you're wanting to have, particularly if you're going, I mean, I don't know enough about um, indie publishing in, in German or, or Dutch or French. I know they're, they're great markets for indie authors. Um, so I don't know what's selling well in terms of eBooks. Um, so I have been really focused on what paperbacks are doing well. And there's a real move toward those sort of love stories and women's fiction. And, and, I, I, and if you were to ask me what my Lost Daughter series, as I would say to you, they're dual timeline love stories. Um, my publisher pitches them differently, but that's what <laughs> they are. You know, they're, they're love stories. They they may not. Um, I'm reluctant to tell people they're romance because some of them, particularly the the section of them in the past, do not have happy endings. But they're all love stories, and that's why I want to write them. And I feel like in Europe, particularly, they're they're really craving those types of stories that are, yeah. you know, they feel good. You're, you know, you're going to beautiful locations. You've got, you know, characters who are, you can fall in love with and, um, and just sort of take you out of the, take you away from the world, I suppose, for a, for a period of time while you're reading. Amazing. Are they set in Europe or where are they set? Yes. Yes, no, the, all, the whole yeah. series is set in Europe. Um, so we've got um, each, so there's eight books and each of them is set in a different country in Europe. They all start in, like the present day all starts in London and then each book. Um, so the first ones that we've got, the Italian daughter and then the Cuban daughter. So each one sort of transports you to a different beautiful location. Um, and so, yeah, but I, I think that that whole, um, someone, I can't think who I was listening to, a podcast, um, there was an author saying, you know, if you, if you managed to sell, you know, to 10 different countries and you made a, th you know, and you got a $1,000 advance for each country or a $10,000 advance for each country, you know, suddenly you've, that's all you need to make that book successful. And mm. I keep thinking about that and going, well, how do you sell into each country? How do you, you know, how do you create that market? And once again, there's an element of luck the same way when I was self-publishing, I managed to hit it at the right time. I feel like I pitched the series at the right time. It was just post covid People hadn't been able to travel. They were dreaming of all these beautiful locations they wanted to go to. They yeah. wanted to 
something that made them feel good to read. Um, so there is an element of luck there as well. But I just feel like there is a whole market there that um, that can be explored. And I think that it's probably harder to sell older backlist titles um, into those foreign markets. They're wanting fresh content. Yeah. But you know, even as a uh, as a indie author if you think I don't want to pay for the translation, I don't want to do these things, but, you know, reaching out to agents who specialize in, in brokering those foreign translation deals, um, I think is a really great option. Um, particularly if you have a good track record with indie sales, um, you know, I think you can really appeal to those agents who can then, you know, try and sell those rights for you. Um, yeah. There are quite a few agents, actually, when you start looking up, there's quite a few of them specializing in doing that. Um, and then there's the opportunity to to keep your English rights and, and sell your foreign rights to, um uh, via an agent yeah mm -hmm. no that makes perfect sense, sense actually mm. yeah yeah so the the 20 so these 21 different um foreign are they foreign publishers and then they do the translation for you and then they sell in their market for the, they do everything um, yeah yeah wow yeah. okay yeah so it's been really interesting so the biggest markets for me um have been so dutch german uh french polish Norwegian and Finnish they've been my my top market so far um, and it's interesting because like my Dutch editor is quite hands-on it was quite scary to start with because like I turned the book in and and she was sent the final copy and she came back and had some changes and I was thinking oh my gosh is every foreign editor going to um, <laughs> need of changes um, and you look they were I've actually come to realize that so my Dutch editor is just so lovely and so approachable and and she always you know she's great at picking up little things now that we're getting further into the series she'll be like well in book one this happened and then you've got that character you know has a cameo in book four but something and I think that would be better off if you use and I was like wow she's really oh, like, I feel like she's all really over that, invested. into that yeah. series <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean I've come to really love receiving her emails because she doesn't ever ask me to make any big changes mm -hmm. um and my English editor sometimes doesn't like another editor making those no. comments and I so no. now I get her to send them direct to me and I just put them into the story um yeah. and then my German editor is wonderful but you know emails me sometimes um the team in Norway are great and then I don't hear from anybody else because I suppose they don't converse in English um as you know um uh, in the same way that my German and Dutch editors do uh so you know it's been a, it's been really amazing but no they pretty much handle everything um and yeah, they come to me with some questions and I have to do a few interviews, sort of like, you know, just email interviews. Um, but it's been a really, it's been a very easy process, um, made easy because of the foreign rights director who sold the rights um, to the stories. But um, it really has just opened my eyes to just how big a market there is out there. You know, mm. we can be so focused on, you know, the sales like paperback sales in the UK and in the USA, are, you know, are just they're so much smaller than they were and the market share is tiny and um it's it can be really daunting but then you go you look at somewhere like the Netherlands or Germany and their paperback sales are enormous you know they're, yeah. they're growing mm. they they love their paperbacks and they produce the most beautiful paperbacks um my my Dutch edition I think sells for 22 euros and I just think oh, wow it seems like a huge amount of money mm. I think they've um I think the first one was 17.99 and the subsequent books are 21.99 and I'm thinking, I just can't believe people pay this much. Yeah, but we but used to, right? Well, yes, we do, we do in New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, we do. But I, and I thought more. Europe was cheaper. You know, I thought yeah. it would be so much cheaper. But you know, they're beautiful. Like you open out the covers, and they they mm. just put so much effort into making these paperbacks mm. beautiful. And um, and also the other thing that um, I didn't realize is that they'll often do the the bigger book, and then they do the pocket book edition, which is just very small to fit in your, your handbag, um, which is similar here, how we have the trade paperback size and then the yeah. smaller one, but these are much smaller. And um, yeah, it just seems they just love paperback still. So yeah, they do. it's mm -hmm. really interesting. So I do think it's worth, it's definitely a mark. It's definitely worth exploring for any author, mm -hmm. you know, um, to see how, you know, how can you pivot into there? How can you create that other income stream mm -hmm. from something you've already written? Um, how can you sell that into other markets to try and make more revenue mm -hmm. from it? Mm, yeah and so you mentioned earlier that so when you you know say a Dutch edition of your book comes out suddenly your Facebook page can kind of blow up yeah so are there any other do you do you notice any other kind of benefits like that from having the books in multiple um languages and, and countries like yeah I feel do you like notice it, the difference yeah I feel like it has increased engagement on Facebook hugely um but at the same time, I'm probably I probably could explore it in such a bigger way and, and really try and target 
um, those different markets through Facebook advertising. I tend I tend to not do a huge amount of um, of my own advertising because I sort of feel like I don't. I sort of feel like you know that my publishers are taking care of that, but I will do. I mean, I will certainly do ads when I've got you know price promotions. It's particularly in Australia, I feel like my ads really work well um, for that Australian market. Um, but it's just yeah, I, there's so much I need to learn about yeah. about marketing and about sales, about you know all those. Like when Wendy does a German. I don't know if you still do it, Wendy, but a German newsletter. Yep. So for her German translations, have you got yeah. anything like that? No, I need to do something like that. That's very good. What I have done though, so with the new website design, we were just talking about it yesterday about having the translation button, um, mm. so that uh, there's I can't think what the site what uh, I can't think who the provider was, so that you can click and and the the site will translate into I think we could do German, French, Italian. Um, there was another language, maybe Spanish, um, and so that was I feel like that's going to be a really useful tool. I you know because I'm. I'm not the biggest tech person. I didn't, I've never even looked at my website to see how many people visit it or like <laughs> when they come, <laughs> things. Um, so I have done that the last month, which has been quite eye-opening. Um, and I realized how many people were visiting my website and how terrible it looked. And I just thought, I feel like this is a this is obviously a bigger tool than I than yeah. I really I mean, obviously I knew it was a big tool. It's my website, but I felt like I need to maximize, you know, all these people visiting from certain countries around the world. Like if they're my, if they're my biggest mm. readership now. And I mean, I've got more Germans and, and Dutch people reading my books than I have English. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. So I feel like, I feel like having that website translation will help. Um, now that I have this wonderful idea about sending out a German newsletter, I might do that as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just the same as MailChimp, but I, uh, I just put in, um, into google translate or i get my interpreter to um just check what i'm doing yeah i just and all my autoresponders are done by the translator and i just then i just go in and at the bottom i say just so you know a lot of this is done through google translate so don't laugh too hard and they love it they're like oh it's brilliant right. you know just mm. got to be up front with them and it's really and easy it, to do you're right and i feel like people they love the fact that you've made an effort right yeah. so yeah. like and a to photo be, of you in New Zealand or scenery, they love all of that, beach walks or whatever. They just mm. barely love it. They love you know? it, yeah. definitely. So yeah. I have been sending out, like a say on my publication day for my next German book, I have been sending out a newsletter, but I have sent that out in English. So I, that's a great idea um, to look into that. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I've feel like i got this fear of Facebook. I'm sure everyone has it, that <laughs> the algorithms change and suddenly... Yeah who can see me no one yeah. um and so I feel like I have probably put most of my energy into building my newsletter um you know my yeah. database um I did go through a period of doing a lot of um you know newsletter builders trying to get more and more newsletter mm -hmm. subscribers but I found that those people just weren't opening my newsletters no. I, so I've they come back to that realization yeah. that I mm -hmm. want my I want my audience engaged I would rather have 500 genuine subscribers than 2,000 Mm. Um, you know, people on there who don't really care about my books okay, so okay yeah it's best yeah so I feel like that is I've sort of put all my energy into my reader group and to my newsletter um, and I think you know there's only so many things there's only so many hours in the mm. day isn't there like when we're trying yeah. to write the books oh, and do exactly. things exactly um, mm -hmm. so for me they have been my two biggest tools um, but yeah it's there's just so many more things I could probably it's do the, it's the overwhelm I, though I think there are so many things right you have to mm. just pick the things that work for you and that you feel yes. comfortable with and I think with you've those. done that right too because yeah. th mm -hmm. they're working yeah. that that proves mm. it doesn't it yeah. yeah yeah awesome and also yeah. if you're trying to do too many things you're just going to do none of them very well right exactly, exactly. exactly. Yeah. two things that you do really well versus mm. yeah. 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 things not very well yeah. So I feel like we're we're coming yeah. to the yeah. end of the interview now, but I just want to ask you one quick, like any advice for someone who is wanting to get either into translations or or um, that kind of inner things or into historical um, fiction like you are, just advice for newbies wanting to emulate you and your career. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, well, look, I think one of the things that I, I think is one of the biggest tools for a new writer is you know, if you want to be writing whatever subgenre you're wanting to write, um, I think, you know, looking on Amazon and, and looking at the top 100 in your specific subgenre and seeing what's selling, I feel mm. like understanding the market is probably one of one of the biggest things, um, particularly now. Like I feel like whether you're self-publishing or whether you're wanting to be traditionally published, you know, people expect you to know who your competition is, mm. um, you know, where your genre fits, you know, who your reader is. You know, like I was on a phone call the other day and my editor said to me, you know, 
so you know who is your reader right now what and they expect me to know you know what sort of mm. demographic they are you know what the, what other books they're reading um you know what other covers are appealing to them so I feel like it's about understanding your market um and the same applies to wanting to move into that foreign translation market you know if you are wanting to reach out to an agent who is specializing in selling foreign rights you know I feel like you need in your query letter you need to be able to say look you know this is what I'm writing my competitors are you know Mm. list a couple of authors this is why I feel like my book would do well in Germany or in you know in in the Netherlands because you know and being familiar with those bestseller lists there as well so you know you can just google the Dutch bestseller mm. sector you can google the Spiegel German bestseller list um, and just really getting a feel for what books are selling in Europe so that you can be talking as if as if you're an expert you don't have to be an expert but you can pretend you're one you know you can that information is right there at your fingertips and I think that if you are I mean, I don't recommend writing to market in a way, especially if you're new to writing, because I feel like you have to write what's natural and what you love. Um, and that's probably where I went wrong early on was trying to to fit into something that wasn't quite right for me. So I feel like you need to, once you have your voice developed, sure, you can go, well, look, this subgenre is selling better, so I can pivot into that and I can write for that. But um, I do think just really, really understanding what other books are selling well and where you might fit um, into that into that category and, and who your competitors are and, and reading, just reading as much as you can um, of other authors who are doing well in the, in the genre that you want to write in is probably my biggest advice. I find that's the hardest thing as we become more established and, and the more we write, we probably, I think we all l lose some of our reading time and, and we all started doing this because yeah. we love reading, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly right. But I think, <clears throat> I think if you're trying to emerge as a new writer, I do feel like you need to be reading as much as possible so that you really understand, you know, what readers are loving and, and, uh, and what other authors are doing and, and just to really get a feel to really understand your market um, before you, before you put your book out there in the world. Great advice. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. So, yeah. Soraya, where can people find you? This amazing new website. They can yes. find me in Thank about you. six weeks' time on my, my new <laughs> website. Um, so um, so my website is sorayalane.com. Um, they can find me on Facebook. Um, all my social handles are Soraya Lane Author. Um, and so, yeah, it's um, you can find me all those places. All them places. <laughs> yeah. And who knows where we can be found from the Spark Girls end of things. Well, I think we can be spelled at spargirls.com, anywhere with Spargirls. Um, you know, we're on Facebook, Insta, you name it. Plus, uh, thank you to all our Patreons who support us um, And every week. And we have a wonderful Facebook group that we um, interact with them. If you become an, uh, one of our Patreons, it is at the $10 tier, I think it is. Mm. I can never remember. Yeah. Um, mm. But, yeah, so come and come along. Yeah. We'd love to have yeah, you awesome. with us. Well, thank you, uh, Soraya, for being with us here today. It's been awesome. I've learned so much. I've had a great time. And yeah, and thank you thank to you. all of our listeners for being yeah. here again with us for another episode of Spy Girls Podcast. We'll be back again next week. But for now, farewell. Thank well. you for having me. Bye.